and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Leaders in triathlete sweat testing and hydration with multi-strength electrolytes that match how you sweat. You can get 20% off with the code OxygenAddict20 until midnight on Christmas Eve. That's a Christmas goodie, isn't it? Special Christmas bonus. That's right. We've also brought you by Team Oxygen Addict at team.oxygenaddict.com. Event-specific training plans, coaching guidance from Coach Rob Wilby and supportive teammates in a private Facebook group. And fuelbycake.com. That's my charity cake recipe book featuring Vicky Holland, Emma Pooley, Chrissy Wellington, Laura Siddle, loads more. And it's only £10 and all money goes to charity, www.fueledbycake.com. There you go. And hello and welcome to the show. And welcome back. It is as we're recording the 12th of December. And I've got to say, it's a little bit frosty and chilly up here, Hells, isn't it? Yes, it is. I was in Wales at the weekend, Rob, and there was even more snow in Wales. Yeah, we haven't got a huge amount of snow here, but I know lots of people have been hammered by the snow, haven't they? Yep, yeah. Someone said to me, so they're down in Hertfordshire, and he said it's the worst he's ever had in 20-odd years down there. Yeah, we've got friends down in St Albans who reckon they've got 30 centimetres of snow. And I was like, really? And they were like, here's a photo. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> you ain't yeah. going to school today. No, no. It's mad, isn't it? Mm. I did think this is this is the time of year when I think... I really wish I had a sodding pair of cross country skis. <laughs> it's a time Every I time. I wish I had a, a thing to scrape the windscreen of my van. <laughs> yeah, I did have that problem this morning. I was like, oh no, I didn't leave myself enough time to de ice the car before going to the gym. And I was thinking, yeah, I'll be yeah. on the, I'll, I'll do my little, you know, Rob, 10 minute pain free today uh, on the trip. I'll be on it at 6 a.m. It'll be fine. I'll get there. Nah, quarter past six. I was mm. like, oh, damn. Anyway, and it's, it's it almost like those minutes count double if someone's stolen them off you because you're doing something daft like trying to get the car or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, nightmare, nightmare. However, I did have my um, I was all over my precision hydration uh, bubble hat over the past few weeks. Actually, I am. I'm genuinely. I am. I'm They're like great, a walking advertisement for them because <laughs> I wear it most mornings on the train, and then my bottles in my bag. So it's like happy days. You are you are the consummate professional, house. What can I say? Exactly. So yeah, I'm spreading the precision hydration love on the on Northern Rail. Rob. I've got to be honest. Mine's been ousted in favour of a red and white knitted um, Santa hat for the duration of December. I'm going festive okay, this okay. year. That's okay. And then back to the colour in January. Back to the colour in January. Exactly. That is more than acceptable. Yes. <laughs> Fine. Oh, um, Rob. Just exciting stuff here for the listeners to uh, to know that today's interview is awesome because it's with an Ultraman World Champion. But also, who else have we got in the bag recently for future upcoming episodes? We have. Well, first, we've got Ultraman World Champion Rob Gray today. And then coming up next week, uh, we will have none other than Lucy Charles, second place at Kona. Yeah, which after is that, ace. Which is ace, yeah. Quality interview. Um, after that, we have got Cameron Worth, I believe. The magical Correct. Cam Worth. Magic Cam likes Worth. himself. We actually, so we recorded with him last week. So that was that was really good. He That's a really good listen as well. Yeah, he's quality. Um, and I've got a couple of other things in the pipeline as well that I'm going to keep my hat hidden under in case it doesn't okay. happen. <laughs> I like that. I like that. But so there we go. Okay, so... In the new year, definitely, we will be bringing you a an interview with Cam Worth and a little Christmas treat is going to be Lucy Charles. Well, I, oh, go, right, go on then. I've got Lionel Sanders lined up. Whether it'll happen or not, I don't know, because he's an extremely, he's always been a busy man, but I'm sure he's even busier now. So fingers crossed that's scheduled to happen this week. So we shall know by next week whether it's up and coming. So fingers crossed, eh? Happy days. So there we mm. go. A whole load of good interviews. Rob, shall we start off with some results let's do it yeah so results sponsored by precision hydration as we've mentioned purveyors of fine woolly hats but also the finest in electrolyte supplements that man woman or horse can buy so get yourself over to precisionhydration.com they've been dead nice hells dave over at ph said do you know what why not for christmas why not give a little bit of christmas cheer and increase the discount until midnight on christmas eve so if any of our listeners are out there suffering the kind of calf cramps i do when i try and jump on the turbo more than once a week help yourself to some precision hydration dead easy couldn't be easier could it could not. So, yep, 20% discount 
with the code Oxygen Addict 20 until midnight on Christmas Eve. It's our Philly boots, everybody. Right then, races that have been happening this weekend. It's a quiet time of year, but we did have the uh, down in New Zealand, the Taupo 70.3, which bizarrely, they didn't manage to get to swim again. So we've had Western Australia and now Taupo 70.3 without swims, haven't we? Yeah, there was um, potentially toxic algae in the lake, which oh, Taupo is so, so beautiful. So you'd be kind of gutted not to be able to swim in that, wouldn't you? I'm looking at the pictures and it's so big as well. It's not like it's a manky little like a little pond you look at it and go really it's like the size yeah. of the sea i'm sure we'd get in swimming it would <laughs> without a second oh, thought but it's just oh it's such a beautiful part of the world um so they ended up doing 3k run 90k bike and then a uh 21k run duathlon i think sorry i'm missing a figure there aren't i no it was a 3k no, run no, that's it? right so they just replaced the swim with a 3k run yeah to try Correct. and shake the field out yep um, and it's fairly toasty as well, actually. The men's the men's winner, winner, men's winner, came in at nine fifty five for the three k run. Which, considering that's a warm up for two plus hours of riding and then a fast half marathon, is pretty toasty, isn't it? But yeah, they both him and Braden Curry both recorded at the same time, didn't they? On that yeah. first run, yeah, yeah, nice. So it must be really hard to know what to do in that situation, mustn't it? Because very few people racing this distance are going out and doing fast 3Ks in training. And yeah. so it's really hard to know, firstly, how hard you can go without exploding, but also how hard you can do without doing yourself a damage, I reckon. Totally. God. Well, anyway, he obviously nailed it. So Mike Phillips got the win there in 3.36 ahead of Braden Curry and then Callum Millwood. And Amelia Watkinson finished off her impressive year with the win in 3.59. Uh, home girl getting the home win Jocelyn McCauley was second Laura Dennis was third and uh, shout out for Sid who was fourth in 403 good old Laura Siddle what does she do on the 3k run 11, she... 11 minutes 20 yeah but three of them did 11 20 yeah I think they came in in a big pack together by the look of things didn't yeah. they yeah so yeah Oof. and she, we'll have to we'll have to try and get back on actually and talk to her about all this stuff that she's been doing won't we be interesting to know how uh how unpleasant it is to try and do a half Ironman after running a flat out 3K rather than swimming. <laughs> I think uh, that's it now as well for Laura for, for racing for um, 2017. So she's had she's had one busy calendar, hasn't she? You'd hope so. There's only three weeks left, aren't there? Two and a half <laughs> weeks even. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Take but some downtime, Sid. You'll be able to like, you know, oof, actually, yeah, have a little break over Crimbo. Now, somewhere else there was a bit of fast running going on was the European Cross Country Championships in Slovakia. So it looks like it was held in um, in Samarin at the same place where they do the championship in the summer, where Challenge hold the championship. Correct. Um, we had a bit of bit of triathlete action with in the men's junior team, Matt Willis placing in fourteenth place and Ben Dijkstra in seventeenth place, um, which which on paper is you know is blooming good running anyway. But when you consider that they were only, like Matt Willis was, what's that, 12 seconds off the podium? Yeah. It's not much, yep. is it, at that level? It's 80 metres behind being on the podium at the European Champs. It just goes to show what the standard's like, doesn't it? Yeah, it's awesome. And uh, Richard Varga as well um, came in there in 69th place, Rob, in the senior yeah, men. Solid. 30, yeah, 32-24. Um, yeah, and it was his first European cross-country championship. Nice to, uh, he, he would have been a home athlete, wouldn't he? Yep, correct. Brilliant. Love it. Nice running, Mr. Varga. Awesome. Um, I, it, it's always funny, isn't it, Rob, how it's a bit like um, Mont Tremblant or something in Canada, how I've said I, I saw that in the thick of winter in like freezing conditions, and then yeah. that's where they have, you know, IMM Mont Tremblant or 70.3 Mont Tremblant, whatever. And then summer in, similarly, you'd have it in the summer where we saw it boiling, boiling hot, didn't we, for the championship? And then. Yeah. It just European cross country to me is always, or just cross country, it's just always cold, isn't it? Cold, muddy, wet, dank, yeah. whatever. It's not usually that warm. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, so there we go. Yeah, frosty, frosty. So we got that. That pretty much wraps up, I think, the results we managed to find that were triathlon and triathlon related this week, doesn't it? Correct. So, Rob, coach's couch. 
Coach's Couch, yeah. So sponsored by Team Oxygenetics. Uh, again, you can download a free two-week sample training plan uh, or get a four-week plan for a fiver. Just email help at oxygenetic.com for details. Uh, we've had a question from Simon on Twitter, who is at S Sidders. He says, <laughs> it's great. With all this snow, it's time to invest turbo or rollers. Too late now, Simon. The DPD delivery guy can't get through the snow to deliver whatever you decide on. You should have done it last week, mate. Right. So my my two penneth on this is um, I think either are going to be good for getting you to do something when you can't get outside. I'm going to give my personal opinion on on this, which is to go for the turbo. I know lots of people love the rollers. Um, lots of people enjoy that sensation of properly, properly. Should we explain the difference between the two? I guess, really, rollers are like you're actually riding your bike on a pair of rollers about just less than a meter wide. And and you can fall off, basically, can't you? That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, they take a little bit of getting used to, don't they? I think so, yes. with with um, the, the, They do have some kinds of rollers these days that have some resistance to them as well. They never used to. They used to just be like a spinning your legs over indoors kind of thing. But I've got friends who've got them now. They love them. You know, they ride and they kind of put it between a doorway. And if they lose the concentration, they kind of, hopefully bounce the shoulder against the doorway and stay up on it. Personally, I'm a big fan of using the indoor trainer to do the stuff effectively that you can't do outside. And so the thing the turbo is great for is you don't need to think about balancing. You can close your eyes, you can turn your music up, you can grit your teeth and you can really push yourself to do the kind of sessions that are really kind of hard to, to replicate doing outside. Um, so my, my gut says, Simon, go for turbo trainer. I think, yeah, that they don't have to be that expensive. They start from 60, 70 quid. And I don't think you have to spend loads of money on them to get 90% of the value. And you can spend up to, you know, a thousand quid plus on one of these smart ones that has got a built-in power meter. Uh, again, my advice would be to buy a cheaper one. And if you haven't got a power meter, get a power meter as well for your bike rather than, you know, rather than spending a grand on a, um, a smart trainer get a power meter for your bike and get a turbo trainer just to ride on. But whatever you've got, even if you're riding a turbo without a power meter, you're going to be able to get on it and get a really decent workout for 45 minutes or an hour, some loud music playing and basically get some bike training done when you just wouldn't have the option or, or at least when it's very difficult to go outside and ride. You know, you can argue you can always ride in the snow and you can always ride in the dark and the rain, but I don't think there's a better way to get fit over the winter than by focusing your training on the turbo trainer. I know you love it, Hells, don't you? You love your turbo. Um, shall I admit, Rob, I haven't <laughs> been on it for a few months. <laughs> you're allowed. You're allowed not to, Hells. Now, now that your uh, Ironman Wales is over. <laughs> yeah, I've not. I've not been on it for um, for a wee while. Um, like really, genuinely, quite a while. I've been doing a. I take the spin class for the tri club. So I do that once a week yeah. and that's about as far as my riding's going at the moment. <laughs> but, um, but I genuinely, I, I love taking the spin class. Well, that's another option as well, isn't it? If, if Simon's got the option to go to a spin class nearby and it's led by somebody who does proper training in inverted commas, I think that the thing that we tried to address in our club was was getting triathlon coaches trained up to lead spin classes as if they were indoor bike training for triathlon. I think there's a lot of spin classes you go to where um, they're not as, how, how could I phrase it delicately? They're not as focused on the bike. You're doing training. more dancing on the bike than actual hard <laughs> interval sessions. It's up and down and side to side and wiggly bum and press ups and all that kind of stuff, which is great. It's a full body workout and for the certain kind of people it's aimed at, that's brilliant. But I think I'd, as a triathlete, if Simon could come to your coached indoor cycling session, you'd oh, have a lot bikes, of fun. He would have a lot of fun listening to your, <laughs> uh, listening to your Spanish music and, and yeah. getting, get, basically getting punished. Yeah. yeah. That is, that is essentially what happens, Rob. Yeah. I do, <laughs> you know, nice little playlist. I've even put together a Christmas playlist. I did a Halloween playlist um, See, I, more yeah. people need Helen Murray to be delivering indoor bike sessions to them, Hells. Seriously, I, I I love it. And then it is actual pain for yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, That's I good. think there's more and more places doing triathlon or bike specific training on spin bikes these days, so it shouldn't be too hard to find them. But my advice, Simon, get yourself a get yourself a turbo trainer. I love Swift. Get yourself a Swift subscription. Get it all hooked up and go and have a play on there. It's great fun. 
Have you been? Do you, are you are you on your turbo at the moment, Rob? Quite mm, a bit. Did I not tell you my? <laughs> I actually, uh, I actually was sick on the turbo last week. Really? <laughs> First time ever. Rep what did number... you do to make yourself vomit? Rep number four of six, the classic five, the classic six by five minutes, and uh, rep number four was getting hard, and I thought, oh, I feel, I felt a bit dodgy actually. I don't feel. Oh, I never felt quite this. Oh. <laughs> Really? And that was it, yeah. Luckily, there was a litter bin right there and it was all fine. But, um, yeah, not good. So was that was that from genuinely overdoing it or were you feeling a little bit rubbish? Honestly, hell's nothing like it has ever happened before or since. I was only riding at threshold. It wasn't like I was going nuts. But all oh. of a sudden, yeah. And then I oh. thought, I should probably stop now. But well, I did didn't. you think, hey, Laura, Ke- Laura Kenny's often sick when she trains. It's fine. Exactly that. <laughs> Woman up, Rob. Put your big boy pants on and keep on going. So I backed off, had a little recovery for a minute or two, and I thought, I feel okay now. So it was one of those good lessons in uh, you can you can recover from something that doesn't seem recoverable from. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Well, I, I don't even, Rob, I, I'm not even sure I'll be going on the turbo over Christmas. I might. I might not. <laughs> See how to. I feel. I'm taking it off you if you don't go on. Between now and Christmas. What, having a little Crimbo Turbo? <laughs> you have to have a little Crimbo Turbo. I want a photo. Photographic evidence of you on We're the Turbo. We're not here. Well, you better um, get on it quickly then. Me. Well, I better have. All right. Okay. <laughs> I did want to do it with mince pies, didn't I? So, uh, fine. Yeah, Christmas Turbo. that's it. I'll, I'll, I'll do a Christmas Turbo. There you go. You have it and right there. And mince pie while you do it. No, mince pie will come afterwards. <laughs> All right, so listen, if you've got any other questions for Coach's Couch, fire them through. You can send them through to Twitter. We're at OHRI Podcast. Facebook, we're at OA Podcast or help at oxygenaddict.com. And uh, we'll do whatever we can to help you out with advice. And um, I'll tell you what, mate, here's a person who is not afraid to get on the turbo trainer in the winter. Today's interview of the week with Ultraman World Champion Rob Gray. Now, what's Ultraman? I hear you cry, Helen. It's the event in Hawaii, which uh, we talked about the other day, and it's a very long way, and it's quite, yes. yeah, it's quite amazing. It's a very long way. Three-day event, 10K swim and a 90-mile bike on day one, 170 miles plus on day two, and then finishing with a double marathon through the lava fields. I didn't realize this, but they actually run the entire second half of the bike course from Kona from the World Championships. Wow. They start all the way up at the turnaround and come all the way back down. So it's a point to point, 52 mile run through the lava field. So anyway, brilliant story. Rob is uh, is an expat Brit who's moved out and now lives in Colorado. So yeah, here we are. Our interview of the week is with Ultraman World Champion Rob Gray. Okay, so we're very happy to welcome onto the show the recently crowned Ultraman World Champion Rob Gray. Rob, thank you very much for agreeing to come on the show. Congratulations on your your recent win in Ultraman in Hawaii just a few days ago. So first up, how are the legs feeling, man? Ah, uh, legs are pretty bad. Uh, it took <laughs> me. We had the awards dinner on on Monday night, and it took me about twenty minutes to get. Uh, but it's about 300 meters from the parking lot to where the awards were. And, you know, literally it took me about 20 minutes to walk that. And they, and they, it's now it's three days later and they, uh, that they, they haven't got any better at all. So there's no, there's no chance of recovery anytime soon, huh? I don't think so. Yeah. Usually it's two, three days and then I'm good to go. But, uh, yeah, from last year, I, I would, it was several weeks actually before I could actually run again. Yeah. I'm hoping to get a bike or a swim in today, maybe. Yeah. I um I've a, a very small taste of this. I did my first ultra run this year. I did a fifty-two miler, and it yeah. was a it was literally about four weeks before I could do anything afterwards. It's yeah, it's so. unbelievably horrendous. So what you must be going through, I just I, I can't even imagine. Yeah, especially the run. Yeah, the swim and the bike is is you know pretty quick to recover from, even though they're very long days. Yeah. But that run, that 52 mile run, it just hammers you, man. So let's, let's, I mean, a lot of the listeners may, I know they're aware of the event because I've, I've talked about it on the previous couple of shows and we went through the results, um, when it was on a couple of weeks ago as we're recording now. Um, but just talk us through what the distances are. It's, it's a three day event firstly, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so it, it takes place over three days. So yeah, that makes it quite fun. It's, it's kind of like a triathlon stage race. Uh, day one, you start with a 10K swim, uh, and in this race, it's you start at the same point that the Ironman swim starts in Kona. So you start at the pier, 
and then you basically just swim down the whole of the run course to the turnaround. So the the exit for the swim is at the Sheraton. Uh, so it's 6.2 miles, 10 Ks. You then have T1 on the little beach park there, and then you'd ride out. It's 90 miles, the bike, on day one, and you finish in Volcanoes National Park. So it's basically some climbing to start, some rollers, and then you end with around about 30 miles of, of uphill and finishing at the Volcanoes National Park. Uh, that's day one done. Then day two, you start where you ended on day one, all the way down the hill, volcano, all the way around the island. Uh, it's, it's about 170 miles, day two, just biking. And you end in Javi, which is the same place that the Ironman bike turnaround is. And then day three is a double marathon. And basically, you run the second half of the, the Kona bike course. You start in Javi, and you run all the way back to Kona uh, along the Queen K Highway. Wow. Okay. So, so three really big epic days in and of themselves yeah. and then stacked back to back day two. Is it a hundred and what to say? 170 something miles on the bike. Is that right? Yeah. 170 miles on the bike. Wow. Nice little warm up for a, for a double marathon the day after. And of course, starting in Harvey, something I didn't realize till I, I read your blog, which by the way is, is excellent. If, if listeners are looking for a, a good read, there's some brilliant race. I, I spent probably an hour and a half reading your blogs today. So it's Thank mostly you. downhill, right? You've got a, you've got a big old downhill from yeah. Harvey, haven't you? So that's not nice on the legs either. So, yes, so you from Harvey, you've got uh, yeah, it starts off a little bit rolling, then it's downhill uh, for at least 10 Ks. But it's kind of rolling. It's like a staircase descent all the way down to Kauai High, which is around about 18 miles. And a lot of that is downhill. And then even when you get onto the Queen K, it's it is very rolling. But there are some portions of that which are downhill. And this year we had a tailwind as well for many of those downhill sections, which just increases your your leg turnover. So. Although it sounds great to have a tailwind, if you're not prepared for that leg turnover and pace, it can really actually hammer your legs. So, yeah, big portion of it is downhill. I, and I included a lot of downhill running in my training this year. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is interesting because I I read on your blog, obviously, you did Ultraman last year and you finished yeah. second last year. And, and the thing that you said was that your legs were just were just hammered on the run, the downhill running. There's yeah. so much quad pain. And that was something that really resonated with me and a lot of the athletes I work with is, is this, this thing of quad pain, basically being unable to run because your quads just hurt so much. So it looks like that's effectively what shut your race down with about, what, what would you say, eight miles to go last year? Uh, even a little more, I think with, with about 14 miles to go, the, the quads really packed it in. Uh, so I was, I was doing a lot of walking for that final half marathon uh, and it yeah. was, it was just extremely painful. It, it was something I have never experienced before where aerobically I felt okay. Energy wise, nutrition wise, I felt good. Motivation wise, I was good as well. And it's just, I, I could not physically plant one leg in front of the other with any sort of running movement without shooting pains in my quads. Yeah. And that, yeah, that really impacted my race last year. Yeah. And so what did you do? We'll come back to the race to talk about Ultraman this year, but what did you do differently then between last year to this year to, to prepare for that? So, you know, the first thing is I did a lot of running at, at faster paces, so faster paces than I would actually be running on race day. And that could be just in my regular training sessions doing regular, fairly long tempo intervals. So, you either one mile intervals or eight to 10, 12 minute intervals at a, at a faster pace, just to get used to that faster leg turnover. And then I would also do long downhill intervals to, to really simulate and, and uh, yeah, that running action downhill that, that really hits the quads. So I live in Boulder and there's some really nice long hills there that are about three, four percent. So I'd actually drive my car up about 10 Ks up the hill and start my long runs with 10 Ks of fast downhill running at about you know, you know, 6.30 per mile for at least 10 Ks and then go straight into my, my regular long run pace. So I think doing that really helped you know, get really strengthen the quads in a specific way for this race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's something that I think happens with, with a lot of the runners over here when they do Ironman UK. The course is, is basically all either upper a shallow grade or all down a shallow grade and yeah. first timers are always getting these 
a totally hammered legs and sore quads and and I think that's a big thing to prepare for, isn't it? Is to run on the kind of course that's going to simulate uh, what you're going to do on race day almost. Absolutely. And and some people don't have access to that. But you know, I think a lot of the gyms have these treadmills that you can actually put at a, at a negative gradient as well. And I did a bit of that. Uh, you know, sometimes we have bad weather and it's not possible to go out. And I did, I did a you know, few runs on treadmills at a negative uh, gradient as well, which I feel that helped. Yeah, 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 smart. Okay, so listen, talk us through the race this year. I want to know, I want to know how it played out in terms of racing because I, I'll, I'll be honest, hands up. I was looking yesterday at the, the website just popped up for Ultraman UK for next year, which is taking huh. place in Wales, and I was looking at that and having the kind of crazy brain that we all do. I was looking and thinking, well, how would that feel swimming ten k, let yeah. alone racing ten k and being in and amongst the front pack and stuff, but. How did your how did your ten k swim play out? How did you approach that? Was it more than just a a steady swim? Was it racing involved, or for you, is it just putting one arm in front of the other? I, I would say there's racing involved. So so for me, the 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 previous two ultramans that I've done, I've always been first out of the water, and yeah, I, I would classify myself as a as a diesel engine type of athlete. So my ultraman pace is not any slower than my Ironman pace. So I just get in and I, I don't warm up or anything before the swim. I get in, I take the first five to 10 minutes easy. That's my warm up. And then I, I just settle into a, a comfortable, it feels like comfortable tempo. That's how I would describe it. Which is pretty similar to what I do in an Ironman. And the beauty of it is you don't have 2000 other people around you punching you in the face or kicking you. So there's no <laughs> contact or anything, which is, uh, which is great. And interesting, you're not actually allowed to draft in the, in the Ultraman swim. So you don't actually have anyone around you. Um, oh, during really? the, okay. which is great. So it spreads out. And of course the, the ocean in Kona is beautiful. So it was actually, I, I experienced the swim this year is, as pretty relaxing. Okay. Uh, so we start off settled into the rhythm and then usually I'm, I'm in front pretty quickly, but this, this year, Jeremy Howard, who ended up being my, my nemesis for the race, he, he's a great swimmer and, uh, he just took off and he was, he was going at a really great pace and, from a tactics point of view, I just I just let him go. I really wanted just to stick to what's comfortable for me. When you're swimming 10Ks, the last thing you want to do is is go off too hard in the swim and blow up. And the listeners will know if if you do if you're in a training session for swimming and and you swim like you know, even three two hundreds a little bit too hard and you try to complete the rest of the session, you just toast and you can't do it. So it's very important with a swim, especially to take it easy and. Just make sure it's comfortable and you never really push yourself too hard. Um, and then usually what I do is around five or six Ks in, I, I kind of look around and see where I'm at and then decide whether I need to push much harder or just settle in. And you've got a paddler with you. You have a swim escort that's with you the whole time. And when I stop for my nutrition, I only, I only stop once or twice. I stopped at about six K to have a drink. He gave me the lowdown on where the others were. Uh, and okay. I could see there was another swimmer not very far away from me. I didn't know who it was. And then I knew that Jeremy was probably at that stage, three or 400 meters ahead at the, at the halfway point. Uh, so it didn't really change anything. I, I did, you know, whether people are there or not around me, whether I'm in the lead or not, once I get to six or seven Ks, you are really, I really up, up the tempo and swim as hard as I can sustainably for the end. And mentally it's really good when you get to, about three k's to go because you you know that you've got less than a nine man distance swim to do so you can sort of feel that out and you just you just swim as hard as you would for a, a hard iron man swim uh, and and then go for it and uh yeah get get to the end and it was it was a very pleasant swim i, I felt very relaxed and i felt uh calm and i felt confident during the swim and i knew i could see behind me there weren't very many other people i couldn't even see that the swimmers behind me so I knew it was just three of us that were in close proximity at that stage. How many overall competitors are there in the event, Rob? They they limit the field to 40 athletes. Okay. And that's largely due to the the fact that each athlete has a crew with a vehicle. And it's just not doable to have more vehicles than that on the course supporting the athletes. Yeah. It just wouldn't be safe. So that's the limiting factor. Uh, this The Ultraman World Championships is 40 athletes, invitation only, and that's so that yeah, that's pretty much the the field that we had. 
Right. Okay, cool. And then, so you come through transition, you, you get changed onto the bike and off you go. Um, yeah. At this point, is it pretty much a solo 90, 90 mile ride? Are you pretty much, you're off on your own and, and you know, it's only 40 in the field. I guess you're not really going to even see many people around or are you? Uh, well, yes, I, I got out. Uh, so Jeremy was 11 minutes ahead of me getting out of the water. Then there was uh, an Italian guy who was, I think, four minutes ahead of me. I passed him in transition. And this is, I think this is a lesson for all types of racing Pe- people often spend way too much time in transition and my view is just do do the absolute minimum that you have to in transition get on the bike and then have your drinks and get your fuel and all that while you're already riding yeah and yeah, that proved to be very advantageous for me because i i overtook second place in transition so i started the bike in second place and it was i i did see i did see jeremy after that so uh, i knew he was by the time I was about 10 Ks in, I knew he was five or six minutes ahead of me. So I could tell that I was making up good ground on that. Uh, and then I, I passed him maybe at about the 40 K 40 K mark. And so I had that carrot in front of me trying to, trying to catch him. And then once I made the pass, uh, at that stage, I could see he wasn't looking that comfortable. So that was a, that was a good incentive for me to, to push a little bit harder and then from then on, it's really just like an individual time trial. I don't see anyone the rest of the day. It's just about really keeping myself focused, my crew keeping me focused, and really just executing the race plan. Mm. Okay. So you ended up, end of day one, what, what sort of lead did you have at the end of day one? I had 17 minutes over Jeremy. And um I'm trying to think maybe uh, 30, or fin- 30 or 40 minutes over Arno Selukov. Okay. And then the others were over an hour, uh, over an hour behind. Okay. And then day so two, a, does that, sorry, go on. So I said, so I had a decent lead. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then on day two, do you all start together? Is that like a, or is it like a time trial start? How does that work? Yeah. So you, you start day two, you line up side by side, two by two, uh, in the order that you finished on day one. And then it's a rolling start. So they start day two. It's at the top of the volcano, at the volcano national park. Mm-hmm. And you have about 40 Ks of downhill uh, at, oh, wow. at the beginning of that. Okay. So, yeah, so that's, that, yeah, that's how it starts. And yeah, it rolls for maybe a minute or so, and then, and then everyone just goes for it. And, and Arno Salikov, the Frenchman, just took a flyer off the front. He really just put down, put down the hammer. And, yeah, he was, he was descending like a beast. So it was, only, it was only really three of us that were off the front at the beginning of day two. And I'm presuming it's not draft legal. It's not. So they, especially on the downhill, you got to maintain your your distance. Uh, so it's I think you know, seven to ten, you know, ten meters from yeah. uh, the front wheel or seven from the from the rear wheel, and you have to maintain it. So they do police that quite heavily on that on that first downhill, especially. After that, it breaks up. So it's not really, you know, it's not really a, a lot of drafting going on at all. Um, but it is it is particularly tough especially in the beginning to go down this hill it's pouring with rain always so it's cold it's raining uh you you kind of overtaking each other as you have different speeds going down the hill and it's not close to traffic so you've got to try and avoid all the the vehicles coming down as well and it's dark at that point as well so old school old school racing oh, yeah totally yeah. traffic lights cars traffic the whole deal yeah, yeah, and you, 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 if you get to a red light, you got to stop. You got to obey all the all the traffic rules and all that sort of stuff, which which does actually play into it from a, a tactical point of view, because you go through this town called Hilo, which has got eight traffic lights, and you have to. You know, my personal strategy is to not to push too hard before that, because you could you could go off the front and have a five minute gap, that's completely erased when you get stuck at a red uh, light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's a bit of cat and mouse with the guys around you to all try and get to the traffic lights. It's like a Sunday club run. Exactly. So <laughs> so my goal was just to stick with whoever was off the front, which I felt comfortable doing given my my, you know, my bike split on day one was you know, at least 20 to 30 minutes faster than most of the others. So I felt like I could comfortably hang with anyone who did take a break, uh, but I actually dropped a chain as I was about three quarters of the way down the volcano. So I, I, and I was going about 45 miles an hour at the time. So I just took the decision to freewheel and not because I couldn't pedal until such a point as my speed dropped to maybe around 20. And I would stop and put the chain back on. 
So they opened a bit of gap, a bit of a gap on me then. It was Tony O'Keefe and Arno Selikov. Uh, and Arno maintained that gap throughout the rest of the day, actually. I did catch Tony, and we rode together for a long time. Um, but Arno did actually get to Hilo and threw the lights before me, and Tony and I got stuck for about three minutes at a light. Oh, the very right. last light, actually. We got through most of them, and the, the, the eighth light, we got stuck, and it just didn't change just to forever. <laughs> the killer. <laughs> Yeah. And so what was the situation at the end of day two? What was the what was the positioning and, and how much time did you have in all of this? Yeah, so we so the I mean the weather conditions were pretty crazy on, on during that ride. It was raining for probably seven hours of, of that ride. Uh so I mean everything the, the bikes just creaking by the end of it, the you know, everything's my brakes weren't working. You actually you end the day with a about a ten K climb these crazy crosswinds it was it was literally just howling you could you could it was noisy that's how loud the wind wow. was it was blowing us right across the road and then you have this 14 mile descent down into harvey and it's very it was wet it's very slippery it's extremely sketchy a little bit technical as well and my brakes weren't really working at all so i took i took it super safe down there um and arno selikov the french guy he i mean he just really went for it down that hill he put another six minutes into me just on the downhill uh personally i didn't feel it was worth taking the risk because you're almost done with with the bike i just wanted to get to the run alive yeah. and he ended up with 14 minutes uh his his day two split was 14 minutes faster than mine which meant my overall lead on him was reduced to 24 minutes okay so i stopped i, I ended day two with around 24 minutes uh, over Arno and 40 minutes on Jeremy Howard going into the run on day three. Now I've, I've been having a look at some of the run splits from, from day three and a pal of mine did a double Ironman years ago and, and he snuck under eight hours for the run. He's a really good runner. He's a two thirty yeah. marathon runner. And I thought that's incredible under eight hours for a, and then it got to the point where people were wanting to go under seven hours for the double marathon in a double Ironman. Now this is even harder. Tell the guys what, what run splits you were, you and your competition were putting together here at this point in day three then. Yeah. So day three, uh, we, you know, we started off, I started off very conservatively. Um, I was, yeah, I, I was incorporating a run walk strategy from the beginning, uh, which, which I think is a good idea. Uh, All the going top coaches through, recommend it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the you know, I'm going through, going through 10Ks. Arno Selikov had already gone through seven minutes quicker than me in the first 10K, so he he really just took one off the front, and he was really going for it. Yeah. Um. I, and I don't really worry about the splits of 10K or even half marathon. The the marathon mark is really the important one to really see the situation and how everyone's doing. So at that stage, uh, Jeremy Howard had gone through the first marathon in 3:08. Wow. Uh, Arno went through in 3.21, I think, and then I went through in uh, 3.30 exactly. Uh, so if you think about that, so Jeremy was 22 minutes ahead of me in the run with a 40-minute gap. I knew that I couldn't – I didn't think he would let up too much in the second half, and I knew I absolutely couldn't. So I knew I had to pick it up a little in the second half, and you know, for the next half marathon, I really just, just focused on uh, you know, on keeping that pace – not letting up. I still, I still included the walk breaks. I didn't, I didn't abandon that for fear of losing more time. And by the time we got to the next half marathon, I had only given up maybe three or four minutes. So I think I was, I was, he was 25 or 26 minutes ahead of me by then. So he started to come back essentially. He started to come back yeah. and then he got the split. He knew that I wasn't letting up. So he ran even faster. So you, it came down to this this crazy head to head race with none of neither of us being able to see the other one because he was so far ahead. Yeah. Uh, but we were both having this virtual race. It's like racing against a ghost man. <laughs> um, and I'm just imagining what he's running. He's imagining what I'm running and we are just trying to match it. And towards the end, it really started coming down to the wire. So, so 10 miles to go, I could see he was, he was putting in more time. Um, and that was when I stopped doing, in, including the walks both because I couldn't afford to do the walks anymore. Uh, but also I, I could feel that when I walked and started running again, 
it was very, my muscles were very tight. They were, felt like they were going to cramp and seize. Whereas if I just kept running, they felt okay. So the last 10 miles, I was just running the whole time. Yeah. And, uh, and I just didn't let up. I was, I was trying yeah. to run faster every single mile and then just keep it at that pace. And, and my crew was great. They were doing the, they were doing the calculations for me. Uh, and basically I had to run just under eight minute miles for the, for the rest of the race in order to, uh, in, in order to not lose. And when Jeremy crossed the line, we finally had a, a finish time to target. Yeah. Uh, of and course. he incredible time, six hours, 24, which is just phenomenal. And so I knew I had to finish in, in under seven hours and four minutes, uh, in order to secure the victory. Uh, and that's when I just had to, I just had to keep on pushing because I could see the time, I could see the distance and I knew it was going to be extremely close and I couldn't afford to let up at all. Yeah. So did you have anything like a, a, a Garmin telling you like a predicted finish time? Did you have anything like that going on or was it just relying on, on friends saying splits and I, things? Uh, so I had my Garmin, but not with a predicted finishing time. I just, I had to do the calculations myself. So, I, so on my Garmin, I have a uh, total run time. I've got average pace and then I have my second screen, which is the one I use mostly is lap time, uh, uh, lap pace for that particular lap. And that's what I, that's what I look at. So I'm looking at what, what and I, whenever I want that to be refreshed, I just hit the lap button and then I get my new yeah. split. So I, that's what I'm relying on. And, um, that was good until about four miles to go. It felt like I was running really well. Like I could, my body felt like I was running about seven thirty pace. And I looked down at my watch and it said I was running ten thirty pace. Oh, no. Went to like nine forty five. Like this is, I, I, and I don't know. Is it because I've run forty eight miles already and and I'm just think I'm running faster than I am, or is it a Garmin malfunction? And you know, fortunately for me, what I ended up doing was looking at the mile markers on the road, and then just hitting lap every time. So I would I would get a manual, it's kind of like old school when you just had a yeah. Timex with where you had to hit the lap button all the time. And that's how I was calculating my mile splits towards the end. So in a way, this malfunctioning Garmin actually helped me because I thought I was, it said I was running 10 minute miles. So I just ran even faster to try and you know, get to where I need, because I need, I needed to be running eight minute miles. And that's what got and, you there uh, in the end, huh? And then you know, with like one mile to go, I, I got my actual split through the mile markers and I, I knew I was probably going to be safe at that point with only probably with about a mile to go. I, I had maybe, you know, over 10 minutes left and i i knew then that i should, would probably make it yeah but i mean really that's that's the equivalent of a sprint finish isn't it in an event that's taken 22 23 hours that's it's amazing it to is. come down to just a handful of minutes in the last mile really yeah it, it was incredible and and you know that presence of, of competition is really what propelled both of us yeah to to do better than than we than either of us thought we would do Will you go back? Will you do it again? Oh, yeah, for sure. Next year. No question. Uh, I'll, I'll be back again. Um, yeah, Jeremy will actually be crewing next year uh, for Nyaki de la Para, who won last year. So yeah. me and Nyaki have get to have a rematch in nice. 2018. Nice. That's great. <laughs> hey, listen, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about was I just can't imagine how to train for an event like this. I'm sure everyone is sitting there having this thought, how on earth do you train for firstly 170 something mile bike ride on its own, a 10 K swim, but stacking them all together. So reading through your blog, what amazed me was how, how little there was of the kind of crazy volume training I was expecting and how you yeah. seem to really concentrate on, on more of the quality type stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say especially this year, that's what I did. Um, and one of the reasons for that, so on the run, in, after my very, very first Ultraman, uh, I did a lot of volume, but not necessarily at a, at a very fast pace. And it took me extremely an extremely long time to be able to get rid of that slow pace. So what would happen is I would go do a, a shorter race like a half Ironman, and I could not run faster. I was running at that slow Ultraman pace. Um, and this year I didn't do any of that. I didn't do any long, slow runs. I just focused on most of my running on very high quality. I, I'm fortunate in Boulder to be surrounded by really great athletes. And uh, twice a week I'm running with uh, Colleen Dereck, who's a multiple uh, Olympian, four-time Olympian, her husband Darren, 
uh, who's a coach in Boulder, and then your Joanna Zyger, who's a 70.3 world champion. These are the people that I run with, and you know, I view it as a good day if I can keep up with Colleen. And we're doing really high-quality stuff, not really more than 10 or 11 miles per training session, but the, the mileage we do within that is uh, you're yeah, really, really superb quality. And then, of course, I do do some long runs around that, but I didn't do any r- runs where I just went and ran like 20 or 30 miles slowly. Usually I would incorporate it with these higher quality workouts. So, for example, with the run group, uh, they usually do that about eight miles from my house. I would do eight miles of s- slowish running just to get to the group, do 10 miles of tempo work with them and then run home again. So that ends up being a long run, but most of it's super high quality in the middle mm-hmm. with a with a bit of easy running either side. Um, and I, I feel with the run that really paid off. I, I did in the last six weeks, I think my longest run was maybe 20 miles. Whereas in the past I've, I've been doing these big double days, like a 20 mile and a, a 30 mile of the next day. And it just didn't seem to be necessary this year. Mm. So partly uh, so you think that the base you've built up over multiple seasons of doing this allows you to kind of, that was your base, but in a previous year almost, and you can kind of put more quality on top. Exactly. And it, it does seem to work. It does seem to work that way indeed. And the, the, the many years of endurance training and racing just seems to pull you through when you need it on race day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The swimming, I didn't really do any. Uh, I had one or two sessions that were maybe seven to eight Ks. Uh, and the rest were, you know, I try to hit four to five Ks every swim workout. And a bit like the run, I do very high quality swimming. So I do a few swims on my own. But most of them, I'll join the master's group in in Boulder where they're doing pretty hard stuff for most of that 4K session. And then I do a little bit before or a little bit after as well to get up to five or six Ks. Okay. Uh, and then one of the days I I do maybe eight Ks, like a double session or something like that. But it, it really is, you, you, you don't need to train any more than you would for an Ironman actually. And it, it doesn't, you, it, your fitness kind of just carries you through on, on race day. It's not like you need to go do multiple 10K swims in training. Okay. Well, one thing that was really interesting reading your your run-up to when you raced Ironman Texas in, in April was that two weeks to go before Ironman Texas, you say in your blog you'd been swimming probably 1,500 meters a week rather than the usual 20K a week. And you'd done this pretty much all through the winter. And... You say you're aware that obviously your swim fitness isn't where you want it to be. So with two weeks to go, you jump back into your old routine of 4K a day and your times tumble from kind of struggling to hit 140, 145 per hundred when you initially get back in to getting down to 122s for the hundreds within a two week period. So it really goes to show that when you've got good swimming mechanics and you've got a good base behind you, you can take a significant time off from swimming, concentrate on other stuff, and that swim will come back. I mean, I've never seen it come back as quickly as that. Um, yeah. But that was an, a kind of an amazing example, and it's so great you've logged all the times and stuff because it's a real interesting read. Yes, I, you know, I would say the um, – you know, I, I went through you – know, so many years ago I had periods of what I'd call average volume swimming, like 10 to 15 Ks a week. Um, you know, and when, when I was doing training like that, it wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't necessarily reach the super fast paces and it would also take me longer to get back into it. And then I did a few blocks of, of pretty high volume, like 30 to 40 K a week. And that seemed to put me on a new level. But what it also did is it meant when, if I took a break after that, if I needed to come back, I could probably get to that similar level, uh, with about, yeah, I would say maybe four weeks of, of training. So with Texas, it was a little bit, uh, you know, the time frame was a little bit short. You know, I, I think I would have been in better shape if, I, if I'd started two weeks earlier. But yes, it does come back very quickly. And I've noticed that with, with any of these other races, that if I if I give it two to three weeks, I'll get back into decent shape. If I give four or five weeks, I can get into pretty good shape uh, in the pool if I swim every day. And it's not necessarily 4K every single day, but it would be four, four to 5K a few times a week. And then if I'm fatigued from the swim, I just get in, maybe just do 20 minutes of of harder stuff, like fast 50s, fast 25s. Sure. Just, yeah. You know, not not the super high volume, but just getting good speed in. And that, that seems to reinforce the mechanics. 
So there's another thing you wrote about here. Right? I'm just scr- uh, scanning through your... There we go. There's the numbers. Um, sort of jumping back into your bike training, your FTP jumped from 280 to 315 in like a three-week period, which, which again, obviously, you've been at that at that level before. It's dropped down and then it's got back there relatively quickly. But I'm always really interested when we see concrete examples of people who have taken a bit of a break from training and then... My feeling has always been, and it's great to see it backed up by evidence like this, that once you've made the engine big, the engine always stays big. It might be a bit third up, you know, it might need firing up a little bit, but you can get back to the level that you were at previously relatively quickly, right? Yes, I I I was actually surprised by that. Uh, It would usually take me a little longer to get to make the jump that big. I, I think the two factors were that, I, my starting point was in really bad shape. So usually I start from a higher point. You know, it would be you know, maybe you know, 295 or 300 that I would start at. And being at 280 is worse than I would normally be at the start of the season. So that, that was one factor. Yeah. Uh, and then I think just focusing on quality for a few weeks and not worrying about doing any super long stuff um, really, really helped me to get to that level. Uh, so that, I, th- I think getting to that level was – it was good for that to happen pretty quickly. Um, I think to my all-time best, yeah, I have had it, my FTP being higher than that before. It seems pretty hard for me to get it to that you know, 330 sort of level. That's uh, That seems to require a lot more work, and I, yeah. I cannot get there very easily. So it's almost like there's three levels. There's the sort of out of shape. There's the decent shape that's you know, good for racing competitively, and then there's the, you know, the, the all-time best shape that I find quite difficult to get to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, talking of your bike training, uh, I know that you've been working with Matt Botterill with your biking. Do you want to talk a little bit about how things have been, how things have been different since you've been coached by him and, and what difference you feel that that's made? Yeah, I would say before, uh, before Matt, I was, I was, I would do very, um, race specific training, which meant if I was racing your know, Ironman or half Ironman, I would spend a lot of time at race pace maybe a little bit above, but not much above that. So if you looked at my power profile, it was, it was pretty good for my, my Ironman or not even, yeah, probably just Ironman or longer. Even my half Ironman wasn't very, it wasn't that much higher than my Ironman power. Uh, and what he really introduced was tra- several different types of training sessions where he's really stimulating power at those much shorter durations, which has really helped my power all round, uh, and given just made me a much more well-rounded cyclist. And even though I haven't had a huge amount of time with him so far, the, the results that I've seen so far have been really excellent. And I, yeah, I'd say going back, back to Ultraman day one, the, yeah, with the 90 mile bike, it gave me a huge variety of arrows in my quiver, so to speak, to yeah. really, uh, you know, to really power up where I needed to power up. There's a lot of very short, steep hills. Um, yeah, I, I felt that really helped, and yeah, I'm looking forward to working with him over the next year and and really seeing how things go. So he's put me in his training sessions. I mean, I, he puts me through a world of hurt. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of suffering going on, and I, you know, I don't think when I was more self coached, I wouldn't have done that to myself. Uh, even though I thought I was making myself suffer, I, it wasn't nearly as much as he makes me suffer. Yeah, he does a lot of very, very top end short stuff, and me and him have uh, coached coached a guy together. I coach his running, and Matt coaches cycling. And I'd be looking at some of these bike sessions and going, "Oh, I'm glad I'm not this kid this week." <laughs> Look at that, <laughs> yeah. ten second power reps and stuff, and you think, "Oh." Glad I don't yeah. have to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty. But tough, it does the but job, it definitely right? Definitely pays off. Yeah. 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 Um, and, now, and also the thing, like with with some of the athletes I coach, yeah, I'm I'm quite nice to them. When I give them an FTP test, it's like a 20 minute FTP test. Not Matt. He makes me go and ride in a one hour FTP test, uh, basically as hard as I can, which is which is which is so tough. I, I haven't done that much in my life before, and I, yeah, even that in itself is a is a great workout, even though it's a test. Yeah, yeah. There's no hiding in that one, is there? No. <laughs> <laughs> So while we're talking about biking, then I noticed you you riding the. It can only be described as the incredible looking diamond bike. It's kind of a beam shaped yeah. bike. If people haven't seen it, now you're obviously a bit of a 
a bike. A, we're all bike geeks here, aren't we? So yeah. is it as good to ride as it looks? It's fantastic. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's superbly comfortable. It's, it's obviously aerodynamic. Uh, one of the unexpected things that I found when I, when I first started riding the Diamond is that in, in crosswinds, it's incredibly stable. And I didn't expect that because if you look at the bike side on, it's got a really big frontal area. And I thought it was going to behave like the bike would behave with a large, uh, with a deep front wheel. Mm. You're kind of getting hit by the wind and shimmering all over the place. But what seems to happen is that the, you know, the wind hits it, it. It passes right through the back because there's no, you know, there's, there's sort of no uh, bike there right through that gap below the seat. Um, and then the frontal area make, means it's just sort of pushed gradually around. So there's no skittery feelings with, that you have in crosswinds. Very, very stable. And that was one of the unexpected benefits I've, I've noticed from the Diamond. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you have much success attracting sponsors? Because obviously with, with the volume of training that a guy like you has to do, it's going to be hard to hold down. A full-time job so how do you go about how do you go about supporting yourself through all the training for the, these crazy adventures rob yeah so the so the sponsors uh help out we mainly with um yeah i would describe it as product so they you know they basically help reduce the cost that i have to spend on on these things um but it's not like yeah you know, it's not like you know, some of these pro triathletes have uh, salaries paid to them by their sponsors so i don't have that but they certainly help me out with a lot of product. I have a, I have a nutrition sponsor called Glucose that uh, you know, give me a, as much product as I need, and that's fantastic. That because that could, in itself can end up being pretty expensive. Mm. Um, and then my, my you know my coaching business that I have really is is uh, funds a lot of these uh, these races. The Ultraman can end up being pretty expensive because you have a whole crew, you've got all the accommodation. It's just it's a pretty expensive exercise plus all the equipment that goes into it. Um, and so my coaching business really helps to, to subsidize a lot of those things. Um, and it, and it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a virtuous circle because success in the races leads to more athletes signing up for the, uh, for the coaching. So that definitely helps as well. Yeah. And where do you see the future going for you? What are your plans going forward? Now, now you will. Let's say that again. Now you're world champion. <laughs> <laughs> What what's well, next? Things, what what huh? what fuels the fire? Is it is it a, de- a determination to defend that title? Is it racing? What did you say that chap's name was that you raced the year before? Uh, Inyaki. So Inyaki Inyaki de la Parra, He 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 won last year. Um, and I, yeah, I think so. He's going to be racing next year again. I definitely want to do Ultraman again. I just I just love the race. I I really enjoy it. Uh, and it's it's the distance that really suits me. And that just you know, everything about it, the three days, the the way that the race is comprised, the long swim with the long bike, you know, now that my runs come together, that you know, it all it all really just suits me. And I want to do it again. So I would I would love to do it again, defend my title. Uh, we we're getting into the territory where there's a lot of good guys racing and we we potentially starting to come close to the um you know the course record territory. So the the times this year we were about I think thirty nine minutes off, but over over three days that's that's actually not that much time. So I think that motivates motivates me. I also feel like there's still more potential. So I think with another year of run training I could do I could do better on the run. Uh, my day two bike was not as good as I had planned it to be. So I think there's something to figure out there. My day one was great. I think that's yeah that that was ideal. I had the ideal day. But I think I've still got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do on figuring out day two, getting that right. And you know, although my run was, in, in my view, this year was perfect execution, I think I've got, with a year more training, I can, um, I can do better at that as well. Oh, so if I feel like from a potential point of view, there's still a lot of work for me to reach my full potential in this race. Cool stuff. Hey, well, listen, thank you very much for taking the time to come on the show and, and talk to us. It sounds like a brilliantly bonkers event. You, you're clearly really passionate about it, which is always great to hear. If people want to find out more about you and your business, where can they go to, Rob? Uh, the, my website is robgray.org. That's R-O-B-G-R-A-Y. Um, I'm Rob Gray on Twitter, RoboCoach on Instagram. 
And if they, from my website, they can find out like my Facebook. I've got a Facebook page for Ultraman and all that sort of stuff. So they can, there's, there's multiple ways to connect with me. They start with the website. They can find anything. Great stuff. Well, listen, thank you very much again. Uh, we wish you the best with the recovery and hopefully within a few days, you'll be able to start walking down the stairs again in a normal way. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. And I'm, I'm very glad my hotel has an elevator. So, uh, yeah, I, w- I would not be able to walk downstairs. So th- th- that's a good thing. All right, man. We'll look forward to talking okay. to you again in the future. Cheers. Thanks, Rob. Do you know how an Ultraman Great Britain next year? Ultraman UK happening at the end of August at Lake Bower. Yes. Yes, I had heard that. It looks amazing, except for the point where it says... We recommend you wear a warm wetsuit because the water temperature is going to be 15 degrees C. Do you reckon oh. you and I could live through that? A 10K swim in 15 degrees centigrade? No, given that I did. What did I do? And I told you I nearly, like, I, I had hypothermia. It, it seemed to last for around about an hour at the very last <laughs> yeah. open water session of the season. I don't know if I'd quite cope with 10K, to be honest. It'd get pretty chilly, wouldn't it? Yeah, so I don't think I'll be doing that. But yeah, I think I said last time that anyone who does do that, you're in for a treat scenery-wise. It will be mm. stunning. Yeah, Physical challenge-wise, clearly you're in for a bit of a tasty treat. But um, yeah, actually, when you look around, it'll be beautiful because it's a lovely part of the world. Absolutely. And uh, thanks very much, Rob, for taking the time for the interview, mate. We really appreciate it. And uh, what a what a hardworking guy, hey? I know. It's very interesting how he's now working with uh, Matt, Matt Bottle. Yep. Yeah, he's uh he was telling me off air afterwards about some of the uh <laughs> some of Matt's special little sessions he's been using to prepare on the bike. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> oh yeah. <gasps> yes. He's had some of Matt's specials for sure. <laughs> I was in there oh. going, Probably Ultraman just felt like quite a nice day out for you then. He's like, Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm very much aware of um Matt's um quality quality that's sessions not a man who's who's afraid to skimp on the quality yeah let's put it no. that way no so <laughs> be careful what you wish for i reckon all right i'll tell you what let's go over on to our, our new section then we've we've got a few bits and bobs happening uh the notes around this world first up nottingham's going to host an olympic triathlon qualification event in 2018 in the mixed relays event yep correct so it's um it's going to be a couple oh, of days is... before the actual Leeds WTS race, isn't it? I think it's a Thursday night, I seem to remember reading. It's Thursday the 7th of um, June, June, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and it's because the Mixed Relay is obviously going to be making its debut at Tokyo in 2020. Um, so it will give various countries basically the first opportunity to get points to qualify their spots on the start line so often in qualification for olympics um you kind of qualify a spot for your country not necessarily Mm. you as the athlete or the team yeah you do it for the country so um that is uh the first of two uh, qualification events that will be taking place in 2018 so you know in september they had the they had the the sort of british relays didn't they the um british triathlon mixed relay cup which seemed to go down really really well so it it's kind of a i i guess that was a bit of a trial really wasn't it and because of it, it was su- such a success then they're Can gonna you remember the distances off the top of your head that they do it's a sprint isn't it is it just 750, 20k, 5k? Oh, oh um, or is it no, short? It's, no. No, it's shorter. Isn't it more like a 300 sort is of it, swim and yeah. stuff like that? It is It is shorter. 310k, 2.5k maybe? I can't remember now. I tried to look it up and I couldn't find very much information about it at all. So it's one to be one to look out for, I think, for the future. I'm excited about it, though. It'll be dead exciting to watch, won't it? It's it's just brilliant. It's re- yeah, it's really really fun. So usually, Rob, it's like three hundred meter swim, seven and a half k bike, and then a one and a half k run. That's ah, so it is really things. short. Yeah, yeah, really really short. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so it'd be interesting to see if some of the some different athletes, like the real youngsters who are super fast runners, that yeah. really suit them, wouldn't it? You know, fifteen hundred meter runners. Well, it's a bit like that with the um, oh, my mind has literally just gone blank. But Super League triathlon yeah 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 isn't it that completely sort of changes the face of triathlon and and people who don't necessarily do 
you know amazingly well in ITU or haven't yet broken perhaps onto the scene in certain races yeah really came through didn't they and it was to their played to their strengths a little bit more and then clearly amazing Norwegians come on the scene and and do brilliantly yeah. but you know what I mean like Jake you might Kurt get to see your example. favorite you might yeah, get in, to see him Austin. yeah and Clegg yeah. quite fancy that there you go. But yeah, it, it will be, um, it's, it's so, yeah, it's really good fun to watch. Yeah, that'd be top, top stuff. Good. More, the more the merrier, I reckon. More events like that. Definitely. Something else, Rob, that caught my eye was that Slovenia is going to have its first uh, 70.3 Ironman. It's going to oh, be on the 23rd stunning. of September 2018. And it's, it's, it's like the first Ironman to go through two countries, basically. Um, and seriously, I think if I was going to do one abroad next year, this, which I'm not really planning to, this would be on my list. Yeah, I've had a holiday in Slovenia and it's just yeah. stunning. It's the yeah. same sort of, um, it's the other side of the Jurian Alps from Klagenfurt, isn't it, where Ironman Austria is? It's just an absolutely, yeah, beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Mm. Good. Check it out, guys. It opens soon. So, and yeah, that's what, uh, 18th of December, doesn't it? Yeah, so it won't be, yeah, another week or so to go to get your entry in for that one. And yeah. then a little bit of news about new courses released for both 70.3 Staffordshire and Ironman UK Bolton. Um, so it looks like Staffordshire is going to have a town centre run. Yeah. Which yep. uh, which will be sort of, I had a look at it actually, it's very sort of twisty and windy and in and out and back front and three laps in and out of the, the street. So it'd be a real good one for the crowds. And they have moved transition for UK Bolton, haven't they, right down into virtually Bolton Town Centre. So it's yeah, now going right. to be a, like a four lap run course from Bolton Town Centre out and back rather than that kind of initial stretch from the uh from the bolton stadium down actually into the town itself that's correct so yeah it's now going to be just almost like two locations because the swim's going to still take place at pennington um but then like the event village um or the event expo uh yeah and the, and the run will um take place and t2 and stuff will be uh yeah where we say queen's park on the outskirts of Queen's Park. Just Correct. be aware, people who are entering Queen's Park ain't flat. <laughs> it, yeah, I did I did uh, see something. It says, before ascending through Queen's Park to Chorley New Road. And Chorley yeah. New Road, well, again, ain't flat. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's, yeah, Queen's Park is like on an angle between Chorley New Road and the valley. So the first year they had it there, the first year I did it, you had to go into Queen's Park and do like dog leg out and backs. Mm. And you'd run all the way down the hill and then all the way back up and turn around and come all the way back down again. Um, so, yeah. So expect some short, sharp uphills through there, guys and girls. Oh, my goodness. Rob, I didn't mean that T2 is going to be in Queen's Park. Um, I meant that the run's going to be in, T in Queen's Park. Um, but T2 is going to be at a venue in Bolton Town Centre. Yeah, I, I don't think it's far away, actually, Hells, you know. I think it's there's a little bit of a park just by Queen's Park from the map that I saw. Ah, I think, okay. I think there's like a, by the look of the map, there's like a huge field of some description near Queen's Park. So that's all going to be there. And I think the finish line's still going to be in Bolton Town Centre, but it's only yeah, that's right. half a mile away or something to the finish line. So you'll be able to stagger on back to get your bike afterwards. <laughs> oh, man, oh man you know what there's, there's still 20 percent of places to be sold for uk so if you're still thinking oh that sounds that sounds great mm, it is great Green Park. Get exactly it is great um and it is a brilliant event so um, yeah. Support, yeah they still have they still have spaces if you're tempted good stuff so get it in all right well, i'll tell you gonna... one thing i was, oh, I was on. just gonna tell you i know um uh i've entered something for next year Really? Yeah. Go on, tell. Yeah. I've entered the Bantham Swoosh. I've got in. I'm very excited by this. I've heard of this. Is this... Go on, tell us all about it. So it is a 6K swim. Um, and you go downstream and then uh, should conditions be uh, favourable, then you have a little swoosh at the end. Like swoosh into the sea? Yeah. Into Bantham, where the yeah. surf is? 
I can't wait. Yeah. What could possibly yeah. go wrong? Yeah, the, the swim <laughs> culminates in a swoosh that as the ebbing tide is brilliant. funneled through a narrow section of river, speeding you along over the riverbed at up to four times your usual swimming speed. It can run at eight knots. It's exciting, invigorating, beautiful and fun. Wow. Brown wetsuit time. <laughs> yeah. I, I genuinely, I I can't wait. That'd so that is brilliant. Yeah. So all being well, that's what's happening. No doubt a friend will sort of say, oh, I'm getting married next year. Guess, <laughs> Guess when? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Guess yeah. what you're doing for your hen do. <laughs> no, they're, they're, not, they're not into that kind of a thing. So, yeah, that, that, that is my um, – that's one thing on the list for next year. Very nice. Can't wait. That sounds fun. Good yeah, stuff. Cool. So there right, we go. We've we got to wrap it up, Hells. I think we should uh, keep buying Fuel by Cake uh, and everyone so far who's bought one. I'm incredibly grateful. So thank you very much. Fuelbycake.com, all money to charity. And yeah, I genuinely am very appreciative of everyone who's got a copy so far. Great stuff. And also don't forget to get yourself some Christmas presents from our sponsors, precisionhydration.com. You can get 20% off with the code OxygenAddict20. Well, listen, until next week, have a great safe training racing week. Enjoy those turbo sessions and don't fall over on the ice like I nearly did earlier. Until next week, I've been Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. See ya.